You're watching. You're watching. You're watching. You're watching West Hartford. West Hartford Community Television. Community Television. Community Television. For the community. 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 By the community. By the community. By the community. By the community. For the community. By the community. And it's a wrap. Welcome to our broadcast and our conversation on domestic abuse. The main question is, can I live this way for the rest of my life? Um, to me, if, if you have an inkling of that you can't, you want to modify it, you want to do something different, you want to change him or anything like that, um, you can't. And, and A dialogue on domestic abuse, next. This is Talk About Our Times, and I'm Lich. Sarah Gallardo is here. After surviving 10 years of domestic abuse by the hands of her ex-husband, she became a certified domestic violence counselor at the Prudence Crandall Center in New Britain. A single mother, she started Sarah Speaks Up to allow her voice to be heard, to encourage, empower, strengthen, and support victims and survivors of domestic abuse. All to educate, as well as to advance awareness, along with prevention, as Sarah's mission is to inspire positive changes in the lives of those that have been abused. Women, men, and children to support them, plus assist living free of every form of abuse. Through her website, Sarah Speaks Up, she does so through guest speaking for organizations and events to convince and provide the knowledge as to how to overcome adversity, defy the odds, take control of your life, ease the mindful pain, and become complete and happy once again. The message of Sarah Speaks Up is loud and strong and is heard to help all. And I am pleased to be joined by Sarah Gallardo, and welcome. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Lynch. Pleasure. After high school and your marriage and the subsequent domestic abuse, mm -hmm. the positive, a brilliant and lovely child was okay. produced. Thank you. <laughs> All that you endured, the strength, the confidence to rise up, to start and bring into action Sarah Speaks Up. I want you to tell the story and your experience and how that measured up to where you are today. You know, it's a, it's a long, sordid story. I, I can give the main major bullet points. Um, after, so going to Berlin High School in Berlin, Connecticut, um, I, I did really well in school. Um, I ended up going to Berkeley College of Music right out of high school for singing. And uh, when I did, leave my home, that's when I began to remember having been molested as a little girl. And so those memories coming back to me really changed my ability to function in a new place um, with my studies, with all these new people, and I began to become depressed, which affected my schoolwork. And um, essentially I was only to finish, I was only able to finish one year. Um, I was picked up from Boston by um, this guy I had been dating over, you know, this, my summer job, and moved in with him. Um, that sort of led to this domino effect of bad relationships because I had no concept of what it was to to be loved in a relationship. Um, that led me to meet my now ex-husband. And at the time, the red flags were, were there. It was the fact that I didn't have the wherewithal or the knowledge base to respond to them properly. Or I would question my gut instincts and make excuses. And this is 
very typical for you know empathetic people who become you know, victims of abuse. Um, I had two miscarriages because of the violence. Um, my daughter, who you mentioned, I was I was abused while I was pregnant with her as well. Um, I ended up wedging my stomach in the corner of two walls when I was being hit when I was pregnant with her so to protect the pregnancy and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's why I was able to actually give birth to a healthy baby girl. Um, I was strangled um, so to ruin my voice and I was shot at one time. Um, these are these are the main major sort of shattering events, if you will. But after the fact, and something that I've come to realize is that coming to terms with the aftermath of being abused and domestic violence, it's almost like the person's trying to erase your identity and make you either nameless and silent or make you exactly what they want you to be. So they want you to lose your sense of self. Exactly. Exactly, and that did happen. That really did happen to me. When my ex-husband went into prison, which was the only way that I got that time of separation, um, I, I was in such shock that I spent my days sitting on a couch and interacting with no one. I had no friends. Um, I didn't talk on the phone. I didn't watch TV. I didn't listen to the radio. I didn't actually go outside hardly at all. Um, I didn't talk to people. I, I, I cared for my six month old baby, um, but that was about the most I could do. You stayed in that relationship for that long and took that because of what? You know, that's a really good question. I, my idea of love had been so skewed since I was little and it carried over into all these other unhealthy relationships. The, the dynamic of abuse is, is so tricky to understand, you know, why do you stay? Some, some people stay because they're scared. Some people need the support. Some people think that that's really love. And, you know, for me, I think I stopped caring about myself and I became this shell of a person and I, I thought that's as good as it got. So then the primary questions to ask yourself would be what? What, what, you, what are the questions that you and others need to ask themselves? In your own words, those questions would be? I think, I think the main question is, can I live this way for the rest of my life? Um, to me, if, if you have an inkling of that you can't, you want to modify it, you want to do something different, you want to change him or anything like that, um, you can't. And, and, you know, why what other questions to ask yourself? I mean, would I want my child to live this way? That's, that's begging something more of a person who's in that position. They're, they're not always able to even see or think that clearly. You know, a lot of people endure um, something that's called gaslighting, you know, which is basically designed to disorient the person and really make it so that their concept of reality is so questioned. Um, they question themselves, they question things that they know to be facts, that everyone knows to be facts. And I mean, an example of that in my own life is that, you know, when I, the first time I drove a car again, after that whole period of shock that I was starting to come out of, I drove so slow, I didn't know which way to turn. Um, you know, my dad was actually getting upset with me. He's like, what are you doing? And he didn't understand that I couldn't make those decisions. Um, this isn't directly answering your question. It was sort of moved into that. You no, know. no, I, I, I want you to speak from here. Yeah, you know. 
Because remember something, I, I, well, I know you know this. You can't change somebody else, but you can change the way you deal with them. Right. So having said that, it's almost as if there are four paths to go down. The suffering that you're going through. Right. The origin, mm -hmm. the cessation, mm -hmm. and then really when you come to the truth right. of that path. Yeah. And you came to that path, how so? You know, it, it's, not, it's not a pretty journey <laughs> to the truth, especially after something like that, because it, it, you learn so many things about yourself as a person, things that you, know, you, you might not want to admit about what you, what you endured and at times allowed, sometimes even facilitated. People become so brainwashed into thinking that they're supporting their partner that they become part of the problem. And live in denial. And live in denial. And they'll lie to themselves, their friends, their family, just in the name of what they think is love. You know, and, and what I like to do, especially, you know, with my clients, is I really like to get down into who they are, how they feel about themselves, and, and try and give them examples of what love actually is. So you find that strength. Yes. Many, many women, but w for this particular dialogue, this mm -hmm. conversation, we'll stay with women. There's abuse, domestic abuse in, in every Correct. arena. Correct. But let, let's stay with women. Okay. So here's Sarah in the bowels, in the abyss of domestic abuse. You rise up. You got the strength and you rose up. How did you do that? And then the, the where for all to come up with Sarah speaks up and let your voice be heard too. Show that compassion and that love and help others, assist others better their own lives when they think, as they live in denial, they can't. Right. You help them how so? Um, I have clients who reach out to me via social media. Um, I get either friend or family referrals. Some people will email me and it's all just because of these kinds of things that I do that people hear about you know me. I'm a certified domestic violence counselor. So what I like to do is help people where they are in the moment that they're asking for the help. And eventually, you know, I'll refer them to the domestic violence organization that services the area where they live, um, wherever that is. I have had people, you know, I'll find that place in, in you know, Iowa or something. You know, it's just Googleable information. Um, but I'm kind of like by being public, People reach out and I like to bridge that gap for them. Um, in terms of one-on-one, -on -one, it's a really personal thing. You know, how do I get to that place and encourage them to push through? You know, everyone's ability to endure, be honest, and survive is, is different. It, it really is an individual basis. Um, not everybody has the same capabilities. And so you try to meet them where they're at and with the most empathy and compassion and understanding as possible because one of the key things and one of the main reasons why people like talking to me so much is because they don't have to explain themselves. They don't have to go over why they feel a certain way or how they got there. You know, I don't need that information because I understand. So you're in your own world. How did you come to Sarah Speaks Up? How did you come to say, this is where I have to meet the domestic ab abuse and do something about it? You know, I was, I attended a support group for domestic violence um, for four years. I was a part of this group and um, over time I didn't realize that the woman who was running the group had planned to move 
And so before she did, she encouraged me to become a certified domestic violence counselor. And so I did that and ended up taking over the support group. When I took over the support group um, for the organization I was volunteering was the Prudence Crandall Center in New Britain. And they had, you know, oh, I wrote a poem and I sent it to someone and they sent it to someone. They said, this is great. Can you read it? I said, sure, I did. Um, that was my first event. They asked me to be in a film called Trauma to Triumph, which is on Vimeo. Um, I did that. And over time, it was, well, wow, you know, she can speak. She's confident. She has a story to tell. And every time I did go out and tell my story, people would come up to me afterwards and say, I needed to hear that. I need help or I know someone else who needs help, um, or, or simply I just need to hear that and that helped me process my own stuff. And the more and more people came up to me and said that, the more I realized I have to, I have to do more. Um, and that's just kinda who I am. I just want to always continue to do more to help other people come through what I've been through because I know how that feels. On the other front, mm -hmm. the bureaucracy, the politics that are involved, accountability in mm -hmm. terms of resources, in terms of training, social workers, uh, MSWs. Mm -hmm. What does local, state, and federal government have to do to enforce stronger laws? You know, I know that the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence has um, or is involved with, um, there is a group through the Legislative Office building, um, the Domestic Violence Task Force. Here in Connecticut, we do have committees of people who are working on changing the laws, strengthening um, the protection of the victims of these crimes. Um, in terms of the federal government, I mean, the federal government has cut so much funding from these kinds of programs that it's it's a really upsetting thing for someone who is so heavily involved in this in particular cause. Um, and I, I could get <laughs> so much more into the political climate right now, but I'm not going to. Um, I think that really what we're looking at is for the people who can help to do just that. Then with that said, in terms of what we're not putting into place mm -hmm. at this time, well, actually two questions. Okay. Number one, is domestic abuse becoming greater and greater as the years go on? And if so, what are we not putting into place in terms of local and state government? What are we not putting into place that needs to be done? Okay, um, so your first question is, has domestic violence increased over time? And I will give you kind of two answers to that. One is that we have no real way of knowing that because back in the day, if you will, people didn't talk about it. Um, victims, if you want to continue this conversation with using the term women, women didn't call the police on their husbands. If they ever did, they were told um, that it was their fault. They were, you know, gave, given suggestions, you know, get him a drink, make him a sandwich, you know, be quiet or just go in the other room or maybe they'll take, you know, the perpetrator out of the house for a bit and they can come back. It was very hush-hush. It was not something to be spoken about. So I wouldn't trust any numbers that, you know, were, you know, were gone by back in those times, I just don't think it was reported. That being said, I do think that so many factors in our society have added to the perceived um, growth of the domestic violence rate, if you will, you know, given that it, the numbers show less back then um, until now, because of you've got people who are financially struggling. You've got, you know, different demographics who are going through their own struggles. Um, you've got the political climate, people who are being laid off. And any tense time, any, anything that sort of creates a ruckus around us 
will exacerbate this issue. People who are abusive tend to do so around, more so around the holidays, more so on weekends, um, and there are statistics to back up those kinds of things. Actually, um, Super Bowl Sunday is the worst, the worst day for H domestic violence. How so? Um, you know, there, there's, there are tensions. Everyone, you know, sports, people gamble, there's drinking. It's a, it's a nationwide I party see. day. Um, so even more so than the holidays, which are more family-oriented kind where, of thing. Where are women's rights now? Be, before we were talking about accountability, mm -hmm. bureaucracy, what can and what isn't being done by government. But where are women's rights today? In my opinion, I don't think that we have equal rights yet. I think that we are, well, I know that we are so much further along than what we had been. You know, we're still fighting for equal pay and we still have issues with maternity leave and you know issues with women losing jobs because their children are sick. You know, I'm a single mom. I can speak fully to the struggle of having a sick child and literally no one else to care for them. What do you do? How can you go to work? You know, you can't bring your sick kid. And so in terms of women's rights, I do think that things have progressed quite far. Um, I also think that it's still a debate and that there are still women out there who would prefer that things stay in some ways the way they were when we were supposed to have been cared for by our husbands. If we talk about the political landscape, mm -hmm. And I'm not putting words in your mouth, I just want to know, do you believe that there is still a failed system? Yes. Because? Well, especially now, if we're going to talk about the current administration, I believe that the potential for women's rights in particular to take a backslide is ever present. And I think that that's the reason why there is such a resist movement, because we have scraped and, and clawed to move as far forward as we have done, which is not as forward as, you know, as far forward as we would like to be. And just to see the general level of misogyny that exists in politics and that seems to be accepted, um, it's, it's extremely disturbing. Sarah Speaks Up, sarahspeaksup.com, mm -hmm. your website. Yes. Sarah Speaks Up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Sarah Speaks Up for the rest of this year into next year. What are the nuances that you would like to see with Sarah Speaks Up to take it to the next level? Well, right now I'm really, myself and my board of directors, we're really focusing on the new program, which is the Veterans for Victims program, which is we will be pairing a, a military veteran with a domestic violence victim to escort them to and from court when they go to testify against their abuser so that they feel safe and supported in doing so. That, to me, was an important program because that encourages people to speak up. If they're afraid, um, they might not go to court and they might not um, speak up for themselves at all. Because I want time for the poem that you read me, the very first of the three poems you read me the other day, because I want time for that, I do want to mention you have a book forthcoming in October. Yes. Is that moving along swiftly? It is moving along, yes. With that said, of the three, mm -hmm. please read the first poem that you shared with me the other day. The it first? The, cho the choice? Is that the very, very first one of the three? Yes. Or is that the one where he was released? I'm not, I'm not certain. Okay. Um, I, have, I have this one here. I don't have it memorized, so I will read it. Oh, please. Okay. Whatever um, you're more comfortable with is fine. Okay. So this I wrote when I received a letter in the mail about my ex-husband who was to be released from prison and all the tensions surrounding that. The news delivered left for my unearthing on a sheet of white that trees died to birth. Letters blacker than the night sky, and I, 
scraped and frayed, hope decayed upon words conveyed, released again. I remember when this happened the last time, bonds broken in attempts at self-preservation as thrown to the wolf I sat, duck-like, floating at the ready for my consumption, hoping the end be swift, the closing of curtain inevitable, fear looming until it comes. Closed closet mind doors, memories picking locks like the thieves they've always been, breathing terror as his laughter echoes. This demon I know. We've danced before across the floor where my blood spattered, like shattered glass on carpet and the shell amidst the shards. Never letting my guard down, hoping walls could stop the pain. But the safety of solitary confinement didn't do the trick just left me sick and lonely. So from mouse to maiden, I grew. No taller than baby's breath, but with sunrise in my eyes. Vision true and clear now from stepping back so far, rebuilding what was savagely, methodically scarred. And in this splendored skin, I live. Stretched and pulled, cut and bruised, healed to encase me. He can't erase me. I am permanent ink. There is no sink in me. I swim. So darkness doesn't scare me anymore. In fact, it's quite a bore. Been here and done this all before. Live to tell the tale as I will forever do. Hard to hear, but always true. And this is how I win. My silent days are through. Power lies within me, and there is nothing more to do. You hurt me, and you lost me, and I'm not afraid of you. SarahSpeaksUp.com, Sarah Speaks Up Facebook, Sarah Gallardo, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching. Talk about our times. I'll see you next time and I'm rich. <laughs>